कृपा सिंधुब्या पतिता पवनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम नम ओं विष्णुपादाय कृष्ण प्रेष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नमने नमस्ते सारस्वते दैव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातरणे ओं अपवित्र पवित्रो वर्वस्ता युंदरी अक्ष सौभा अभ्यंतरा सुचि श्री विष्णु श्री विष्णु श्री विष्णु ओम ज्ञान तिमरांद से ज्ञान अंजन शवाकाय चक्षुर्मील तस्म श्री गुरव नम मुखति वाचाल पंगुंगाते गिरी यत्पाथमहंग वंदे श्रीगुरु दिनतारण यत्पाथमहंग वंदे परम आनंद माधव चुनादी सुनीचन चौराव सहिष्णुना अमानिना मानदेन कीर्तनीय सदा हरि हरे नाम हरे नाम हरे नाम एव केवल खलो नस्व 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 गतिर्यथा ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय so where did we leave off krishna is in his assembly house and a unknown person has arrived at the door this unknown messenger introduced himself as a representative of 20800 kings who had been imprisoned by jarasandha who was going to sacrifice them in front of lord shiva in his form as mahabairava so the messenger has come with a request that all these kings are krishna's surrendered souls and they would like krishna to deliver them so that's where we left off and this next episode is called enter narada narada muni bajaya vina radhika ramana name at the very moment the messenger of the imprisoned kings was presenting their appeal before krishna the great sage narada arrived both nar uh, because narada was a great saint his hair was dazzling like gold and when narada entered the assembly house it appeared that the sun god was personally present in the midst of the assembly lord sri krishna is the worshipable master of even lord brahma and lord shiva and yet as soon as krishna saw that the sage narada had arrived krishna immediately stood up with his ministers and secretaries to receive the great sage and offer respectful obeisances by bowing his head as it is said twice in bhagavad gita mam namaskuru the devotee should bow his head unto the worshipable lord so in this case krishna was bowing to narada the great sage narada took up a comfortable seat and lord krishna worshiped narada with all kinds of paraphernalia as required for the regular reception 
of a saintly person. While trying to satisfy Naradaji, Lord Krishna spoke the following words in his sweet and natural voice. Oh, my dear great sage among the demigods, I think that now everything is well within the three worlds. You, Narada, are perfectly eligible to travel everywhere in space, either in the upper, middle, or lower planetary systems of this universe. Fortunately, when we meet you, we can very easily take information from your holiness of all the news of the three worlds. For within this cosmic manifestation of the Supreme Lord, there is nothing concealed from your knowledge. You know everything. And so I wish to question you. My question is, are the Pandavas doing well? And what is the present plan of King Yudhisthira? Will you kindly let me know what the Pandavas want to do at present? The great sage Narada then replied to Krishna, My dear Lord, you have spoken about the cosmic manifestation created by the Supreme Lord, but I know that you are the all-pervading creator. Your energies are so extensive and inconceivable that even powerful personalities like Brahma, the lord of this particular universe, cannot measure your inconceivable power. My dear Lord, you are present as the super soul in everyone's heart by your inconceivable potency. And exactly like the fire which is present in everyone, but which no one can directly see. In conditioned life, every living entity is within the jurisdiction of the three modes of material nature. As such, they are unable to see your presence everywhere with their material eyes. By your grace, however, I have many times seen the action of your inconceivable potency. And therefore, when you ask me for the news of the Pandavas, which is actually not at all unknown to you, well, I am not surprised at your inquiry. My dear Lord, by your inconceivable potencies, you create this cosmic manifestation, maintain it, and again dissolve it. Only by dint of your inconceivable potency does this material world, although a shadow representation of the spiritual world, appear to be factual. No one can understand what you plan to do in the future. Your transcendental position is always inconceivable to everyone. And as far as I am concerned, I can simply offer my respectful obeisances unto you again and again. In the bodily concept of knowledge, everyone is driven by material desires, and thus everyone develops new material bodies one after another in the cycle of birth and death. Being absorbed in such a conception of existence, one does not know how to get out of this engagement of the material body. By your causeless mercy, my Lord, you descend to exhibit your various transcendental pastimes, which are illuminating and full of glory. Therefore, I have no alternative 
but to offer my respectful obeisances unto you. My dear Lord, you are the Supreme. You are the Para Brahman. And your pastimes as an ordinary human are another technical resource, exactly like a drama on the stage in which the actor plays parts different from his true own identity. Being that the Pandavas are your cousins, you have inquired about them in your role of being their well-wisher, and therefore I shall let you know about their intentions. So now please hear me. First, I may inform you that King Yudhishthir has all material opulences which are possible to achieve even in the highest planetary system, Brahma Loka. Yudhishthir has no material opulence for which to aspire for. Yet, Yudhishthir wants to perform the Rajasuya sacrifice only to get your association and please you. King Yudhisthir is so opulent that he has attained all the opulences of Brahmaloka even on this earthly planet. Yudhisthir is fully satisfied and does not need anything more. Yudhisthir is full in everything, but now Yudhisthir wants to worship you in order to achieve your causeless mercy. And I beg to request you to fulfill Yudhisthir's desires. My dear Lord, in these great sacrificial performances by King Yudhisthir, there will be an assembly of all the demigods and all the famous kings of the world. My dear Lord, you are the Supreme Brahman, the Personality of Godhead. One who engages in your devotional service by the prescribed methods of hearing, chanting, and remembering certainly becomes purified from the contamination of the modes of material nature. And what to speak of those who have the opportunity to see you and to touch you directly. My dear Lord, you are the symbol of everything auspicious. Your transcendental name and fame have spread all over the universe, including the higher, middle, and lower planetary systems. The word dig vitanam indicates that Krishna's transcendental glories spread throughout the universe like a cooling canopy over the universal directions. In other words, the whole world can find shelter under the cooling shade of Krishna's lotus feet. Thus, Krishna is known as Bhuvana Mangala, the symbol of everything auspicious for this world. O oh, my dear Lord, the transcendental water which washes your lotus feet is known in the higher planetary systems as Mandakini. It is known in the lower planetary system as Bhogavati, and it is known in this earthly planetary system as the Ganges. This sacred transcendental water flows throughout the entire universe, purifying wherever it flows. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare, Hare. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 
ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय so this next part is called so udava what do you think is best now just before the great sage narada arrived in the sudharma assembly house of dwaraka lord krishna and his ministers and secretaries had been considering how to attack the kingdom of jarasandha because they were seriously considering this subject narada's proposal that krishna go to hastinapur for maharaj yudhisthira's great rajasuya sacrifice did not much appeal to them but lord krishna could understand the intentions of his associates because krishna is the ruler of even lord brahma Therefore in order to pacify them Krishna smilingly spoke to Uddhava My dear Uddhava you are always my well-wishing confidential friend Therefore I wish to see everything through you because I believe that your counsel is always correct I believe that you understand the whole situation perfectly therefore i am asking your opinion what should i do i have faith in you and thus i shall do whatever you advise krishna smiled because krishna was about to demonstrate udava's brilliant ability to give counsel in different situations one of krishna's innumerable qualities is chatura clever which means that krishna can perform various types of work at the same time thus krishna could certainly have solved the dilemma of how to simultaneously satisfy yudhisthira's desire to perform the rajasuya sacrifice and also the imprisoned king's desire for freedom from jarasandha however krishna wanted to give his dear devotee uddhava the credit for the solution and thus krishna pretended to be perplexed So this reminds us of a statement in the 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita when Arjuna asked the universal form who are you and what is your mission the universal form said i am time and i have come to destroy everything And then the universal form tell, told Arjuna that all these kings on the battlefield already are dead but nimitta matra bhavasavya satyam Arjuna I want you to take the credit I want you to win the fame and the glory So that's the same concept here as Prabhupada just said Krishna wanted to give his dear devotee Uddhava the credit for the solution and thus Krishna pretended to be perplexed It was known to Uddhava that although Lord Krishna was acting like an ordinary man Krishna still knew everything past present and future as krishna himself says in the bhagavad gita however because krishna wanted to consult with him uddhava began to speak in order to render service to krishna hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 
Rama Rama Hare Hare So that's an interesting point that the devotee becomes glorious by rendering service. Prabhupada writes in the first canto of the Bhagavatam in one of his purports that uh, service is the most congenial form of intimacy. So the devotee, whenever the devotee has the opportunity to serve Krishna, that is intimate because Krishna is a person, the devotee is a person. That is the very nature of bhakti. The servant and the servant and the one who is served. God is the one who is served and the devotee is the servitor or servant. All right. Our final episode for tonight, Uddhava advises Lord Krishna. In the presence of the great sage Narada and all the other associates of Lord Krishna, Uddhava considered the situation and then spoke as follows. Oh, my dear Lord, first of all, let me say that the great sage Narada Muni has requested you to go to Hastinapur in order to satisfy King Yudhishthir, your cousin, who is making arrangements to perform the great sacrifice known as Rajasuya. I think, therefore, your lordship should immediately go there to help Yudhishthir in this great adventure. However, although to accept the invitation offered by the great sage Narada as primary is quite appropriate, at the same time, my lord, it is your duty to give protection to the surrendered souls. And both purposes can be served if we understand the whole situation. For unless we are victorious over all the kings, no one can perform this Rajasuya sacrifice. In other words, it is to be understood that King Yudhishthir cannot perform this great sacrifice without gaining victory over the belligerent King Jarasandha. The Rajasuya sacrifice can be performed only by one who has gained victory over all directions. Therefore, to execute both purposes, we first have to kill Jarasandha. I think that if we can somehow or other gain victory over Jarasandha, all our purposes will automatically be served. The imprisoned kings will be released and with great pleasure, we shall enjoy the spread of your transcendental fame for having saved the innocent kings whom Jarasandha has imprisoned. But we must understand, King Jarasandha is not an ordinary man. Jarasandha has proved a stumbling block even to the great warriors because his bodily strength is equal to the strength of 10,000 elephants. So, if there is anyone who can conquer this king, then he is none other than Bhimasena, because Bhim also possesses the strength of 10,000 elephants. So the best thing would be for Bhimasena to fight alone with Jarasandha, then there would be no unnecessary killing of many soldiers. In fact, Jarasandha will be very difficult to conquer when Jarasandha stands with his Akshauhini divisions of soldiers. So we may therefore adopt a policy 
more favorable to the situation. We know that King Jarasandha is very much devoted to the Brahmanas and Jarasandha is very charitably disposed towards them. Why indeed, Jarasandha never refuses any request from a Brahmana. I think, therefore, that Bhima Sena should approach Jarasandha in the dress of a Brahmana, beg charity from him, and then personally engage in fighting Jarasandha. And in order to assure Bhima Sena's victory, I think your lordship should accompany him. If the fighting takes place in your presence, then I am sure Bhima Sena will emerge victorious, for your presence makes everything possible that is ordinarily impossible. So this reminds me of the deciding factor in the battle of Kurukshetra. The, the Pandavas were completely outnumbered in terms of military by the Kauravas. But how was it that the Pandavas emerged victorious in the 18-day war? The reason is because Krishna was on the side of the Pandavas. So that was the determining factor. The mere fact that Krishna was driving Arjuna's chariot, that made the impossible possible. Uddhava continues. Indeed, Lord Brahma creates this universe and Lord Shiva destroys it simply through your influence. Actually, it is you who create and destroy the entire cosmic manifestation. Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva are only superficially visible causes. Creation and destruction are actually performed by the invisible time factor, which is your impersonal representation. As you state in Bhagavad Gita, Kalosmi, I am time. Therefore, everything is under the control of you in the form of the time factor. If your invisible time factor can perform such wonderful acts through Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, will not your personal presence Help Bhima Sena conquer Jarasandha. My dear Lord, when Jarasandha is finally killed, the queens of all the imprisoned kings will be so joyful at their husbands being released by your mercy that they will all sing of your glories, being as pleased as the gopis were when released from the hands of Shankachuda. All the great sages, the king of the elephants, Gajendra, the goddess of fortune, Sita, and even your own father and mother were all delivered by your causeless mercy. We also have been thus delivered, and we always sing the transcendental glories of your activities. Therefore, I think that if the killing of Jarasandha is undertaken first, that will automatically solve many other problems. As for the Rajasuya sacrifice arranged in Hastinapur, it will be held either because of the pious activities of the imprisoned kings or the impious activities of Jarasandha. And so, my Lord, it appears that you are to go personally to Hastinapur to conquer demoniac kings like Jarasandha and Shishupal. You are to release the pious imprisoned kings 
and also to perform the great Rajasuya sacrifice of Yudhisthira. Considering all these points, I think your Lordship should immediately proceed to Hastinapur. The Yadavas were extremely eager to kill Jarasandha and thus to caution them, Sri Uddhava spoke as he did. Jarasandha's death could come only at the hand of Bhima. Uddhava had previously deduced all of this from the Jyotirag and other astrological scriptures Uddhava had learned from his teacher, Brihaspati. This advice of Uddhava's was appreciated by all who were present in the Sudharma Assembly Hall. Everyone considered that Lord Krishna's going to Hastinapur would be beneficial from all points of view. The word Achutam indicates that Uddhava's proposal was fortified by logical reasoning. Furthermore, Shukadeva Goswami specifically indicates by the term Yadu Vridha that it was the senior members, not the junior ones, who welcomed the proposal. Young princes such as Aniruddha did not like Uddhava's proposal since they were eager to fight Jarasandha's army immediately. The great sage Narada, the elder personalities of the Yadu dynasty, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna himself, all supported the statements of Uddhava. Lord Krishna then took permission from his father, Vasudeva, and grandfather, Ugrasena, and immediately ordered his servants, Daruka and Jaitra, to arrange for travel to Hastinapur. When everything was prepared, Lord Krishna especially bid farewell to Balaram and the king of the Yadus, Ugrasena. And after dispatching his queens along with their children and sending their necessary luggage ahead, Krishna mounted his chariot, which bore the flag marked with the symbol of Garuda. The word Vaji indicates that some of Lord Krishna's queens were transported by horse-drawn conveyances. The household attendants mentioned herein included washerwomen and other helpers. Before starting the procession, Lord Krishna satisfied the great sage Narada by offering Narada different kinds of articles of worship. Naradiji wanted to fall at the lotus feet of Krishna, but because Krishna was playing the part of an ordinary human being, Narada simply offered respects within his mind. And fixing the transcendental form of Krishna within his heart, Narada left the assembly house by the airways. Usually the sage Narada does not walk on the surface of the globe, but travels in outer space. So after the departure of Narada, Lord Krishna addressed the messenger who had come from the imprisoned kings and told the messenger that they should not be worried for Krishna would very soon arrange to kill the king of Magadha, Jarasandha. Thus, Krishna wished good fortune to all the imprisoned kings and the messenger as well. And after receiving this assurance from Lord Krishna, the messenger returned to the imprisoned kings 
informing them of the happy news of Krishna's forthcoming visit. All the kings were joyful at the news and began to wait very anxiously for Krishna's arrival. Om Tat Sat 